Uh, we have Paolo Perino, who is also one of the organizers of uh, uh, the boot camp, uh, speaking about sums of squares. Um, we're going to have two lectures this afternoon, and then we'll come back tomorrow. Great. Reminder, sorry, I was supposed to say this before now. Actually, you have to remind them. That's the first part. Oh, yeah. If you have questions, you can tweet or whatever. <laughs> I hope I'm saying this correctly. Anyway, uh, two, three things, I guess, before I start. Uh, one of the stated goals that we got from Alistair is that we're supposed to bore the experts. Now, you know, if we don't bore the experts, we haven't achieved our goal. So you know, I, I fully intend to do so. Uh, the second part is uh, I'm going to actually use a board. I don't have slides, or I didn't prepare slides for this. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of slides. I'll post links. I mean, there, we have a lot of material related to, to these kind of things. Uh, so if you want to actually see everything in full detail, you'll certainly find links over there. The other thing is, no, you know, kind of, um, I'm doing these lectures with Ankur. Ankur is not here today. He'll be here, uh, I think, on Wednesday. He promised that he'll watch this talk. I actually don't trust this. No, you know, that he will actually watch it. So I'll just write something in here, no, you know, kind of, and if he's watching it, then I expect him to mention it. I'll just write a, a word. No, you know, kind of, and I'll erase it later. I just want to see whether, so nobody asks him about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Just a little test that I want to run in here. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of square stuff. So let me first just start mentioning some things about some different programming. Uh, um, Michelle gave us a very nice introduction. I just want to remind you a couple of things that he said, and I'm going to also emphasize a couple of different things, uh, mostly because they're related to the kind of things that we, that we talked about. So he really defined this very nice form of, um, I, also I want to use some particular notation that I'm going to use. So he defined this uh, very nice primal dual form of uh, what the semi-definite programming looks like. Um, I'll define my notation in just a second. But the idea, let me write exactly the same thing that he wrote, is that we're going to have uh, a variable x, where x is a symmetric matrix. This funny expression that I'm using in here is an inner product between matrices, a trace of the product. So in here, I really mean a linear functional on x where x is a symmetric matrix. I have affine constraints a sub i of x equals to b sub i. And I have the positivity constraint x being positive semi direct Right, and you know, you know, of course, algebra is beautiful, but geometry is even nicer. So what is the geometry of a semi-definite program, at least you know, kind of the simplest things that you can write in here? It's really, when you look at the feasible set, it's about the intersection of the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. Right, that's what this means. It's a very nice convex cone the cone of all symmetric matrices, which are possibly semi-definite, and some affine subspace, which I like to call L. And this is going to be my affine subspace over there. So really, semi-definite problem is a problem of intersecting a nice convex cone with an affine subspace. And then I optimize a linear function over this intersection. Right. By the way, if you like linear programming, linear programming is exactly the same picture, except that this cone is a polyhedral cone. It's a non-negative orphan. Right, so really, the difference between linear programming and semi-definite programming is that we go from the non-negative orthon, the polyhedral cone, to a non-polyhedral cone, which is a cone of positive semi-definite matrices. Right, so the other beautiful thing about, that we've seen in, in Michelle's lecture about semi-definite programming, like any conic program, is that it comes with a nice dual. Let me write it here. I'll erase it later. Which has a form max of v transpose y, subject to the condition that the sum of a sub i, y sub i, is less than or equal than c. So as a reminder, he wrote it in the abstract form or the right an operator and the adjoint. So in here, if my operator is the one that takes a matrix into the vector of the a sub i's inner product with the x, the adjoint of this is exactly the sum of the a sub i's y sub i. Right? So in here, if you want, we have a map that takes x into a1 x, a n a m x. So the adjoint of this linear map is something that goes from Rm to symmetric matrices. And that's exactly this map over here. So I'm just writing exactly the dual, but in coordinate form. Right? Like, he gave us the abstract version. So semi-definite programming, again, and again, of course, the geometric picture is, is exactly the same. In here, what we have is intersection of the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. Just take this to the other side. And we're intersecting this with some affine subspace. So geometrically, these things look exactly the same on the primal and the dual. 
What are some of the properties? Again, I'm just restating what Michel said. Of course, we have weak duality. What does weak duality say? It says that any feasible solution of the primal, the cost of any feasible solution of the primal is always going to be below the cost of any feasible solution of the dual. Or essentially that if y and x are primal and dual feasible, then cx is going to be less than or equal than b transpose y for any feasible, uh, for any primal feasible x and for any dual feasible y. And of course, inequality is the wrong way. Uh, Right? Uh, so weak duality always holds, and, and the argument, the reason for this is really this one line argument that Michel wrote before. I'm not going to repeat. Right. Also, under weak conditions, under minimal conditions, really, we also have strong duality. And the value of the primal is exactly the same as the value of the dual. And I'm not going to, again, like, you know, uh, for the purpose of this talk, like, you know, say too much about like, you know, kind of what these conditions are. I think what, what Michel said is perfectly. Right? So somehow, really, we have this very nice. Like, you know, set of problems, and uh, one of the things that um, it's kind of surprising, even though my definite problem has been around for 20 years or so, is that we still don't understand it. Like, you know, we still really don't understand what's going on in here. We don't really understand its expressive power, and I think uh, it will become clear <coughs> later what I mean by this. So let me give perhaps a couple of examples, if you've never seen a semi definite program, in which ways they differ from what a linear program is. Right, and let me just write a couple of examples. Perhaps, I guess, if you've never seen this, I guess this picture kind of uh, clarifies a little. Perhaps the simplest uh, way of stating the difference with the linear problem in case is, of course, a feasible setting here is not necessarily going to be polyhedral. Right? So let me give a concrete example where we'll see this. So let me write a particularly nice, my example one, a particularly nice my definite program that it's going to be something like this. So what do I mean? Let me not write the cost function. I don't care about the cost function. The cost function is just some linear function over this set. So what am I doing in here? I'm putting a, ma a positive semi a definite matrix that depends linearly on x and y. So it's really something, I guess, in the way that I wrote it, like in the dual form. Right, so what's my feasible set in here? It's going to be the set of x's and y's that make this matrix positive semi-definite. And you know, kind of, we need to decide or how do we plot this, right? I mean, we need to find out what this set is. It turns out, I mean, you can do these things by hand. You can do this in you know, mathematical, maple, whatever. But what happens in this case is something very nice. Like, you know, the feasible set is essentially something that looks like this. It's, of course, a convex set. And this convex set is going to be something over here in there. In fact, how do we draw even this picture? So certainly the boundary of my set is going to be given by when the determinant of this will vanish. That's exactly when these matrices stops being positive semi-definite. If we write that down, it's going to be an equation that will look like this. And this is, of course, the simplest case of an elliptic curve. Right? So the feasible setting here is exactly determined by an elliptic curve. I mean, exactly this polynomial equation in x and y. And the feasible set corresponds to what's called the oval of the elliptic curve. This corresponds to this nice convex region in here. Why do I do this? For a couple of, I want to illustrate a couple of things. On the one uh, hand, as I promise, I mean, it's, it's obvious, the feasible set of semi-definite problems is not a polyhedral set in general. But also to mention one other thing that's very important for many things that we want to do later, which is that when you think about the convex set, that comes from semi-definite problem, we shouldn't really think of the boundary of the set. That boundary comes with a lot of baggage on it. And in this case, it comes with all these other components that are outside my convex set. And those actually play a very important role in understanding what you can and cannot describe using semi-definite problem. For polyhedra, this is not terribly interesting. Because when you have a polyhedra, then somehow you extend the facets and you get a hyperplane arrangement. And some, so you get this arrangement of hyperplanes, which are all the inequalities. And that's interesting, but it's not terribly interesting. I mean, that's, it's a very interesting area, hyperplane arrangements. But you know, kind of a lot more happens when these things are not necessarily put here. Right. <coughs> Questions? Is that clear? Good. 
So let me de describe another example, my example two. And I guess I should mention this is a, perhaps one of the simplest examples of hyperbolic polynomials. This polynomial is actually a hyperbolic polynomial. If you want to understand the geometry of these curves and lots of things, we can ask Cynthia, one of the experts in this. Uh, so I'm dumping it all on you. I <laughs> know enough now. Uh, let me give my second example, which is again something that I think many of you are probably familiar. So perhaps in here I should write like an elliptic curve. So my second example is something that I think many of you know, in particular at least two or three people in the audience, which is you know, kind of this uh, nuclear norm stuff. So what's the idea in here? Let me just define a function. So I have a matrix M, and let me define this function, which is just a sum of the singular values of my matrix M. So remember, whenever we have a matrix, a rectangular matrix, it, it doesn't have to be symmetric or anything, even square. We can look at the singular value decomposition, u sigma v transpose, where u and v are uh, orthogonal matrices and sigma is diagonal, or as diagonal as it could be, given that it's rectangular. And we can define this quantity called the sum of the singular values of n. So in general, it's kind of a, comp I mean, it's a nice but somewhat complicated function of n, but it turns out that there's a very nice description of this in terms of semi-definite programming. Let me write it explicitly. Something like, you know, this quantity m is actually the minimum of the trace, or one half, times the trace of u plus the trace of v, subject to the condition that my matrix uh, u, m, m transpose v is positive symmetric. Right. So I claim that the following is true. It's a simple proof. Like, you know, I'm not going to prove it in here. But that there's a very nice description of this function, this nuclear norm, as a solution of a particular semi-definite problem. Right, so given m, I have to optimize, let me be very explicit, over u and v. In here, this matrix will have to be positive semi-definite. I minimize a trace of u and v. If I find the u and v that minimize a trace of this function, I claim that the optimal solution is going to be exactly this. Right, and this is another nice example of a function that in principle, you know, there's no reason why they should be related to some kind of semi-definite problem, but there's a very nice characterization there. So these are just examples, but I think both of them illustrate a couple of different things. That, you know, I think there are themes that you know, kind of people have spent quite a bit of time of, uh, trying to understand, and we'll see a little bit later in the week. Notice, in particular, a very important difference between the kind of things that we're doing over here versus the kind of things that we're doing over here. In here, I want to represent a set in the space of x's and y's. And I wrote a semi-definite program that has only x and y. Right? In here, I want to represent a function or a set. Say that my set is a norm of m less than or equal than 1, the unit ball of this norm. And what's kind of interesting in here is that the semi-definite program that I wrote actually has additional variables. It has variables u and v. Right? So what, this is an important difference. It's exactly the issue of extended formulations that we're going to see later in the week. Like, you know, kind of, uh, I think Prasad, Thomas, and Hamza are going to describe a little bit this whole idea of extended formulations and how do we work with it. But geometrically, the picture that you should keep in mind is that rather than representing my, perhaps I'm interested in some set living directly in some Rn, and the difference is that we're going to represent this set as a projection of something else that lives upstairs. Right, so in here, again, it was enough to write the semi-definite program only in x and y. In here, I had to introduce these new variables u and v, and then write some semi-definite program in u, v, and m. And the projection of this on the space of m's only is exactly the set that I want. Yes? Is any convex set a projection in a natural way of a set? In a trivial way. I, or you're saying of a nice set. Uh, we'll Del talk a little bit about this. Uh, it's actually. Versions of these are kind of open in different ways, depending on how nice is nice. And I think you guys will probably say more about this. Uh, good. Questions? Yeah, so in um, example one, mm -hmm. so the set of all 3 by 3 PSD matrices is convex, if you think of it as a nine dimensional value. Mm -hmm. So the, the set of X and Y is that satisfy that PSD constraint seems to be just a uh, all vectors, all nine-dimensional vectors that, that define 3 by 3 PSD matrices with some 
conditions, like set of entries being zero, set of entries being one. Right, right. There's some affine. That's exactly this picture, right? So, yeah, so where the, I mean, it seems if you have a convex set and you project it, mm -hmm. you always get a convex set. Yes, you always so have a convex set. Where does the stuff on the left uh, come from? Okay, so the surprise, the stuff on the left. What do you mean? Uh, the curve. This curve. Oh, just look at the zero set of this equation. Yeah. Right. So when I look at the equation that defines the boundary of this set, the equation that defines the boundary of the set is this. When you look at the zero set of this, this polynomial vanishes not only in here, but vanishes also in here. Ah, but those are not feasible points. They're not feasible points. Ah, okay. Yeah, they're certainly not feasible, right? This is my feasible set. Okay, okay, no. But you know, the point is every polynomial that vanishes in here will also, sorry, let me say it the other way. Any polynomial that vanishes on the boundary will also vanish in this other component. So this will put constraints, and again, we cannot talk about this, into like, you know, kind of the kind of sets that can be represented using semi-definite. These other components in there, like, you know, they actually play an important role. So what do I want to say? One of the things that I want to say, like, you know, we have a very intuitive understanding of what linear programs look like. We know what the feasible set of a linear program looks like. right? If I give you, like, you know, kind of a set, you can very easily tell me, yes, this is a polyhedron. No, this is not a polyhedron. Right? Yes, I can. If I give you a set, this, and I, of course, I have to define how do I give it to you. Then it's a, we don't know how to answer this question. Right? Now, can I represent this set using semi-definite problem? And there's a lot of stuff that we know. There's a lot of machinery that you know, we're developing around this. But you know, I, think, uh, I think our understanding of you know, spectrohedra is pretty primitive, I think, at this point. Good. Um, so let me just. Uh, questions? Is this clear before I move on to something else? Good. So, okay, so what is the, uh, I guess I promised that I was going to talk about uh, some of course stuff. So let me start perhaps even before with uh, the question of why do we care about some of course at all? And the reason, again, I guess people care about this for different reasons, but one question that you know, kind of perhaps is very natural about all this stuff is if I give you some multivariate polynomial, so I have a polynomial p in n variables in there, let me say that it's agreed to d. I want to try to understand whether p is non negative. No, you know, is p of x greater or equal than 0 for every x? You know, it's a decision question of, like, you know, kind of I give you a polynomial in several variables, and I want to try to understand whether this polynomial is greater or equal than 0 yeah. everywhere. So I guess uh, some things that are true, but like, you know, perhaps are not obvious. First of all is that we can answer this question at all. Right, so if p is actually a concrete polynomial given by you know, kind of perhaps rational coefficients, it's a non-trivial fact that there is an algorithm that will actually answer this question. And the reason why I say it's non-trivial, because you know, kind of in principle, it's not obvious at all uh, how you would certify such a question. Right? I mean, in principle, you would, it seems as if you would need to check in all points whether this inequality is true. Uh, remember, this is not the combinatorial situation that I think many of you are used to. You know, in here, I'm really asking the question about the reals right? for every point in Rn. Uh, so it's, in, again, somewhat non-trivial that you know, kind of this is decidable. In fact, it's a consequence of tarski seidenberg that says you know, something much more general. It says essentially that any problem where you have uh, quantifiers and you know, polynomials over the real uh, over the real, so it's going to be decidable. And it's also, of course, I guess to be expected that this is kind of NP hard. Right? There's no efficient algorithm, or we think that there's no efficient algorithm that will allow us to answer this question you know, kind of as long as the number of variables is like, I, I, let me just say, as long as the degree is greater or equal than 4. Right? Uh, so what can one do about this? Like, you know, why do we care? I guess we'll see it in. in uh, 
I guess in a few moments, or I guess many of you can imagine that you know, if you care about optimization, then trying to understand you know, the simplest possible case you know, is my uh, function greater or equal than zero. It's, it's kind of a question of interest. Um, but in here, uh, the question is, what can we do? Right, so it's pretty obvious I, that there's a nice sufficient condition for this, which is you know, kind of this sum of sort condition. So if p, I can actually write it in this form then certainly this will imply that p of x is greater or equal than 0, right? That's kind of a trivial implication. And one of the things that, you know, again, I think we're, we're going to try to understand, I guess, in the uh, minutes that we have left is, what can we do with this? How far can one push this condition? How powerful this condition is, even though, you know, you know in principle, sounds, you know, pretty much a triviality? The question is, that, you know, again, I mean, how, how much mileage can one get, uh, I think, one of them out of this? And so let me mention also a few aspects which are kind of interesting of this. First of all is, uh, and this is going to be important not so much in the case of polynomials but for some other things that one may do later, that this is very nice because this is a syntactic certificate. It's purely syntactic, right? In the sense that you know, it doesn't really care about exactly what a polynomial is. Now, you know, I, it, I, it doesn't really care about the interpretation of the, my variables x, actually. The only thing that I'm really using is that you know, kind of squares are not negative. Right? That, you know, kind of the square of something is a, non is a non negative quantity. And one of the useful things of this is that then this whole machinery can be generalized whenever we have different notions of positivity. What, there's lots of notions of what does it mean for something to be positive. And there are lots of ways in which I can write polynomials in objects which are not necessarily variables. And we'll see perhaps a few examples of this today and in, in Nancor's lecture. Um, so, you know, kind of as soon as one writes, and of course people have been doing this for 200 years, as soon as you write this implication, natural question is, you know, are, are there situations or under what conditions is a converse going to be true? Right? So, like I said, certainly, yeah, people were asking, Hilbert asked his question, you know, kind of 180, 117 years ago, right? In particular, you know, kind of I'll mention a little bit about, you know, kind of, uh, I think the specific question that he asked. But one of the things that we can try to understand in here is, of course, there's two parameters in here, the number of variables and the degree. And perhaps it is a case that for some number of variables and for some degrees, there's some equality in there between these quantities. So it turns out that this is indeed the case, that this is really, you know, I think, the starting point of much of the theory. Right? There's some beautiful or very simple argument that one can give, then depending on the number of variables and the degree, uh, let's try to see perhaps what happens in here. So the number of variables, I'll have one, two, three, four. So these are univariate polynomials, polynomials into variable, three, four. Degree two, four, six, whatever. And let's try to reason a little bit about this. Right? Again, I could just write it, and I, I essentially I'm going to write the answer, but you know, let me at least convince you that two cases in here, two families of cases in here, you all know, and you, know, kind of you should be able to derive on your own. And so the first one is a case of univariate polynomials, right? this column in here. And I claim, I mean, easy claim, that if you have a univariate polynomial that is not negative, right? so the picture is you have your polynomial in here, which is not negative. Then I claim that if it's non-negative, it is actually a sum of squares. I can write a decomposition. This is not very difficult to do. I mean, essentially, the, the reason why this is true is because if you have a univariate polynomial, of course, I can write it as a product in terms of the roots. right? And if my polynomial is actually non-negative, then it shouldn't have any real root. And in particular, if it has complex roots, sorry, if it has real roots, then it must have them with even multiplicity. So from these two facts, it's very easy to write an explicit sum of scores decomposition based on the factorization of a polynomial. Let me skip the arguments. It's a very simple exercise. But if you have a polynomial like this and all the TCYs are complex, they will come in complex conjugate pairs. So you can pair them up in a right way and produce a sum of scores decomposition. Right, so that's kind of this column. In all this column, non negativity is equal to sum of squares. The other case, this is first row. So this first row corresponds to quadratic polynomials, 
polynomials in uh, of degree 2, or less than or equal than 2. And again, it's not very easy to convince yourself that the case of quadratic polynomials really corresponds to the case of positive semi-definite matrices. Right? It's kind of really the same thing. A matrix being positive semi-definite means that a quadratic polynomial is not negative. Right? You multiply right and left, you get exactly a quadratic polynomial. And we do know that, non -negative, that positive semi-definite matrices have eigenvalue decomposition or have Cholesky factorizations or whatever you want. And if you reinterpret the Cholesky factorization or an eigenvalue decomposition, it is exactly a sum of squares decomposition. I will see examples, I think, later. So this whole row is also true. And this is all, again, fairly classical stuff, 1800, so that. <coughs> right? So Hilbert showed this other case. Interestingly, when you look at quartic, so let me just be very clear about this. So when you look at quartic polynomials in two variables, for non-trivial reasons that I don't have time to explain, it turns out that you know, kind of the converse is also true. When you have a, a, a polynomial in two variables, and in here, for the experts, I'm looking at the non-homogeneous case. So I'm really looking at true polynomials in two variables of degree 4, a quartic. Then if it's non-negative, there is going to be a sum of scores decomposition. And you know, kind of one can actually find it. So all of this Hilbert proved. He also showed that in all these other cases, this is not true. He showed in a non-constructive way that you know, kind of in all these cases, there were non-negative polynomials that are not some of course. I'll give you an example later. But you know, kind of somehow he completely classified you know, kind of this picture based on the number of errors in the degree. By the way, I should say, in case you, know, kind of you like this kind of thing, there's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful generalization of all this stuff to also a few other cases, more structured and whatever. A very nice paper by Bleckerman, uh, Velasco, and Smith, you know, that somehow they relay these kind of things with very classical algebraic geometric questions. Uh, so really, if you want to truly understand why these kind of things are true only in these cases, and you know, kind of, I mean, that paper, is a, it, it's, it's really, really nice. Good. Uh, let me also say, sorry, questions. This is clear. Remember, in here, I'm only looking at the number of variables and the degree. I'm not looking at anything else. Right? Of course, if my polynomial has more structure inside, perhaps linear dependence on the coefficient, perhaps some sparsity patterns, whatever, then you know, the answer may change. But if you really look at the whole class, you just abstract the polynomial in terms of you know, the number of variables and the degree, really, this completely classifies the picture. You said something about constructive, so the 2, 4 entry in particular. Uh, yes, it is constructive. I mean, you have to solve polynomial equations and whatever, but it is essentially constructive. Good. Um, so let me just one mention, let me mention just one thing because it's really the seed. Uh, of course, when people did this, there was no real algebraic geometry. Right? I mean, the, the understanding of you know, what the solution set of polynomial equations was, you know, I think, you know, fairly, I mean, what's just beginning. So one of the very nice things about this whole story is that this was really the birth of uh, real algebraic geometry. I mean, trying to understand in here what exactly is a distinction. And in particular, one of the things that Hilbert asked very explicitly was the following. So fine, you know, kind of I know, I prove, that's what Hilbert said, you know, kind of that the situation is like this. Now. Perhaps in this case, for these cases, I have a polynomial which is greater or equal than 0. I know that it cannot be the sum of squares of polynomials, but perhaps it can be the sum of squares of rational functions. Right? That was exactly Hilbert's question. Is it true that if you have a polynomial which is non-negative, that it's going to be a sum of squares of rational functions? And also ex exactly one of the things that I guess you know, like, you know in 1900, like, you know, Hilbert wrote this list of 23 problems that he presented in the ICM, the International Congress of Mathematicians, in 1900. So question number 17 was exactly about, like, you know, is it true that the negative polynomials are some of course of rational functions? So like, you know, look it up, wonderful statement of what it was. I mean, lots of very nice history. And by the way, if you want to read in particular about the historical aspects you know, there's a very, very nice paper by Bruce Resnick, something called yeah. Concrete Aspects of Hilbert's 17th Problem, which is really a delight to read. Good. So um, questions? 
so far. So of course, what do we want to know? I mean, can we decide this question? Is this any better? Like, you know, sure, this implies this, but there are lots of conditions that will imply that the polynomial is not negative. Is this any good? Right? We want to try to understand. Yeah. Is there uh, some kind of information theoretic argument? Because the number of parameters in two i is about half the number of parameters. No, 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 no. It, it's really an algebraic geometric reason. It, there's no number. Of, I mean, uh, it's not parameter counting. Um, good. So. I mean, there's two questions, really, or three questions, perhaps, that one would like to understand. Like, you know, how powerful is this quantity, I mean, or this technique, like, you know, kind of, uh, and how constructive is it? Perhaps some other things that we can ask later. So let me at least say one thing uh, in terms of, like, you know, even though like, you know, kind of this looks, as I said, like a pretty coarse condition in order to guarantee the non-negative, it's really at the heart of like, you know, much of the stuff that we do all the time. And let me just give just one example. Like, you know, kind of, again, one could write, and people have like, you know, somehow uh, tried to understand this for a long time and mentioned these connections. But for instance, our good old friend, like, you know, kind of the, when you look at the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, right? I hope I'm writing it in the correct direction. Like, you know, kind of, uh, it's kind of interesting to know that essentially for any uh, um, uh, that we can write like a nice inequality uh, essentially for all n and m that actually certify the Cauchy Schwartz inequality just in terms of the sum of squares of polynomials. Right? So Cauchy Schwartz is a nice example of like, you know, kind of an inequality for which you can give a very clean, like, you know, kind of purely algebraic proof. In here, this, of course, in every finite dimensional space. Like, you know, kind of, but uh, somehow it doesn't really require, in a sense, any kind of reasoning about like, you know, kind of what the x of i's and, and, uh, and y sub i's are. The other thing that I should mention is that this is really, as I said, this is cauchy short. Like, you know, kind of, this is a special case of what's called the cauchy binet identity. Which is kind of like a generalization of this that will also tell us that you know, some expressions are naturally non negative. They actually have some kind of nice sum of scores decompositions. In fact, if you think about the, what this expression is, these are actually two by two minors of like, you know, kind of a, a matrix that you can form with my x sub i's and my y sub i's. And somehow Cauchy Binet um, generalizes all this stuff about squares of minors in kind of in a way that. Yeah. And exactly the same thing is true for many other inequalities. I mean, if you try to look at the AGM, the arithmetic geometric inequality, or you try to look at the uh, Helder inequality, or many of all this classical stuff, really at heart, you know, their proofs are really not, or, or you know, one can give alternative proofs if you want, or specific proofs, where really the only thing that's going underneath is some kind of very easy syntactic argument of this type. And by the way, I mean, all the way in the 60s, there was a big logic effort mostly by Chrysler to try to understand exactly this question. Of, like, you know, kind of what, when you reconstruct some of these proofs, like, you know, kind of what, is it, what are the axioms that you're actually using underneath? So people in logic have been looking at these things like, you know, for uh, quite a long time. Um, OK, questions? So I promise you, and again, this is mostly for general culture. Like, you know, kind of, I promise you, I said that Hilbert proved this in some kind of non-constructive way. Let me just give you an explicit example in here that was only find, that was found by Motzkin, actually all the way in 1960. It's kind of interesting because there's a big jump, like, you know, kind of between the somehow the things that Hilbert did all the way in 1900s. Apparently, people were very afraid of, like, you know, kind of this kind of things because the arguments in Hilbert's paper they're not easy, like, you know, they're non-constructive and whatever. And somehow it seemed like, like you know, much of that was intrinsic. But like, you know, kind of then uh, more and more examples, explicit examples were produced. In particular, Motzkin gave this very nice example of a sextic. Let me just write it: x squared y to the fourth plus one minus three squared y squared. So this is a, a sextic polynomial in two variables. So it falls exactly in here, right? And kind of it's not very difficult to convince yourself that this polynomial is non-negative. So whenever you plug in every, non every x and y, then you know, this will actually be always a non-negative number, but it's not a sum of squares. So one part is easy, 
you know, why is this non-negative? Because this is really the arithmetic geometric inequality, right? Applied to the numbers. So this is really AGM applied to x squared y, x y squared, and one. Right? What you're having here, if you divide by three, is exactly the arithmetic mean of the. Uh, let me see. This is a product and the cube root. Let me know kind of this is. Uh, I guess I need to square this. Uh, yeah. So this is a sum divided by three, and this is a geometric mean. Right, so this is certainly going to be non-negative, and you know, it turns out that one cannot show this, you know, kind of, uh, or that that polynomial is not a sum of squares. And there's many, many, many families of examples that we now understand. You know, kind of that, for instance, will fit in here. And even if you impose additional conditions, like if you want your polynomial to be, you know, to have whatever additional properties, for most of those we understand that, you know, at least in some cases, we can produce these counterexamples. And this will come back because many of the examples, for instance, for lower bounds in combinatorial optimization, things that try to prove that some of squares cannot do better than this or that, that Ankur, for instance, will talk about, what well, they really do is a bootstrap. Many of these examples, you know, kind of different structure, and essentially you embed these problems into you know, kind of either di different kinds of things. Okay, good. What's a big, I mean, or what's a question at this point? No, you're not going to buy. define this very natural sufficient condition for non-negativity. What we haven't said anything at all is how we decide this, right? No, you're not going to, I mean, sure. Now you have a sufficient condition. You told me that this is hard, but no, you know, is this actually any easier? Can we actually decide this sum of squares condition no, you're not going to be in a nicer way? And the claim, no, you're not going to what, I'll, what I'll try to show in just one second, is that this is nothing but a semi-definite problem in disguise. If we really look at what's happening over there, what we really have is a semi-definite programming problem. So this question is exactly reducible to a semi-definite problem. And this is what I'll try to do in the next five minutes. Questions? Tweets? <laughs> <coughs> Are you checking, Ben? <laughs> OK. Oh. Somebody please create an account. <laughs> OK, good. So what's the answer to Hilbert's 17th problem? Uh, yes. The answer is yes. The answer is every polynomial will actually be, every non-negative polynomial will be a sum of squares of rational functions. In the second part of the talk, I'll present a much more general version of this that will actually imply this as a very particular special case. Yeah, I should have answered. So why? So remember, what am I trying to decide? I have p, some given polynomial p. I'm trying to decide whether my polynomial is a sum of squares. And remember, this is a polynomial in n variables of degree to d. And the key, actually, there's many reasons, I guess. But let me just make one observation, which is actually fairly important. Which is know this one can show, I mean it's actually a theorem, not a very difficult theorem, but it is a theorem, that if I have a polynomial in here in n variables of e to d, and I have a sum of scores a composition, then for sure the degree of these polynomials q sub i is going to be less than or equal than d. So claim the degree of my q sub i is going, it's enough to look at the compositions where the degree of the d sub i is less than or equal than d. And this may seem like a triviality, but actually it's not true in some other situations. We'll talk about later, for instance, when you look at things on the, on the cube, on the hypercube, then suddenly something like this is not true. If I take this equality to mean e equality modulo the ideal, I mean modulo multilinear things, we'll talk about this later, then you know, kind of in general I may have some squares of higher degree than this, with th there may be cancellations. But in the case that we're working here, there's no cancellations or no pos possibility of cancellations. So if p has agreed to d, then the q sub i will have to agree degree less than or equal to d. So what is the idea? Let me describe it at a high level. I'll, do, I'll work out in detail an example in just a second. But the idea is kind of really simple. It's kind of really that if, I, if p is actually the sum of q sub i squares, I can write this kind of in the following form. I can write q1. Actually, let me give, 
perhaps another observation also, that in here, um, this is perhaps a little less obvious, that I can always restrict to the case where the number of squares in here is finite. I don't gain anything by writing integral of, square, of squares. And furthermore, I can bound a priori how many squares appear in there. We'll see why. But you know, essentially, the number of squares is bounded by some quantity. Let me actually write this n plus d2c. Right. So let's actually assume, actually, let's just assume that this is finite, like I wrote over here. So the point is, what this tells me is that I can write my p as a sum of squares kind of exactly in this form, as is product of this row vector and this uh, other vector. And now, of course, if I have a polynomial, a polynomial is nothing but if I can pick any basis for the span of polynomials of degree uh, that satisfy the degree of the q sub i is less than or equal than d. So I can actually write this as some matrix, let me call it L, times some basis of the space of polynomials of degree less than or equal than d. So in particular, I can pick you know, kind of all my monomials of degree up to d. And my claim is that this is going to be of the form some matrix times the basis of polynomials. So in here, I'll write, of course, a transpose. So what this means is I'll have this vector. In here, I'll have matrix Q. And I'll have in here the same vector over there. And I guess I should consistently use either square brackets or curly ones. Right, so again, what am I saying? Something very simple. If you accept that I wrote it in this form, then the point is each one of these is in the span of finitely many polynomials. Right? The set of polynomials of fixed degree is a vector space. I can pick any basis, and I can pick the coefficients in here, and then I can rewrite this by redefining q in this form. So my claim is that a polynomial being a sum of squares is nothing but being able to express it as a quadratic form in here, where q is going to be positive semi-definite. And in here, we'll write any basis for the space of <coughs> polynomials of a real less than or equal than d. Right? And the beautiful part is that you know, unlike many things in life, you can actually run it backwards. Right? So in here, if you actually have a matrix Q that satisfies this, I can just factor my matrix, and then I can produce a sum of scores of composition. So if you understood this, that's great. Let me just work out explicit examples so you'll see that you know, kind of, it's actually a very simple uh, thing what I'm saying, what, what I'm doing. So let me just pick an example like this. 2x to the fourth plus 5y to the fourth. There's also there are some points that I want to make in here, not just because I'm not sure I trust this. Plus 2x cube y. So here's a nice quartic polynomial in two variables. So you know, kind of, I guess my question is whether this is a sum of squares or not. Right, and of course, it's kind of not obvious at all you know, kind of from this description. So what does this recipe tell me that I should do? I should, this is a quartic polynomial in, in two variables. So I should pick in here some basis of the space of polynomials in two variables of degree less than or equal than 2. Because my polynomial is homogeneous, in here I only need to pick homogeneous monomials, I mean, it's kind of, if you don't believe me, just write all monomials. I just want to simplify my life a little bit. So I'll write this. I'll write this. And again, there's a point of why I do this. And then in here, I'll just write the generic matrix. I don't know what the entries of this matrix are going to be. So let me call them q0, q1 to 2, q3, q4, q5. Right, so this is a symmetric matrix in that I don't write the entries below the line. So now, what does this tell me that I have to do? I have to try to find a matrix which is positive semi-definite and for which this polynomial is the same as this polynomial. Let me make two points, which are kind of important. The first one is, if these were not monomials, if these were somehow my variables, this would be a triviality. Right, because a quadratic form, if this was a quadratic form, the quadratic form uniquely determines the matrix representation. But in here, because these variables are algebraically dependent, there's non-trivial relations between these, CCGs, if you're an expert. 
Lo mismo que no va If I multiply this by this, I get the square of this. Right? X squared times y squared is the same thing as x y squared. So what that causes, the effect of these you know, quadratic relationships that exist between these monomials is that there's not a unique matrix in here that realizes these polynomials, but there's actually a whole affine subspace. And why there's a whole affine subspace, like I said before, because if you expand this expression, let's actually do this, what do we want to get? I'll get x to the fourth times q0. This is not the interesting example. y to the fourth is not interesting either, times q3. But when you look at, for instance, x squared, y squared, what happens in here is I get one coefficient that comes from this term. And I get another contribution that comes in here from q5. Right, plus whatever, whatever, whatever. Right, so the point is that the coefficients in here, they're always, of course, that they should be linear combinations of the entries of this matrix. But this map is not invertible in general. I cannot go uniquely from my polynomial to my matrices. So what this causes is that there's really a whole affine subspace of matrices that represent this polynomial. Or if you want geometrically, what we have, what I'm trying to decide is that is there a positive semi-definite Q that satisfies these whole linear equations? And the geometry of this is exactly, of course, I have an affine subspace described by the equation that this polynomial has to be the same as this polynomial. And I'm trying to decide whether there's a Q which is positive semi-definite on this affine subspace. Right, so what we're doing really in here, when I write P as sum of squares, what I'm really writing underneath is some nice semi-definite problem. Let me remove the word nice, depending on, uh, I guess, how close to numerics you are or what exactly you want to do. Uh, but certainly, let me know kind of a sum of small conditions, exactly, really, some kind of semi-definite problem in this case. Right, so for this example in particular, you can easily verify a little bit up there that the matrix, so for instance, if you look at this matrix 2, minus 3, 1, minus 3, 5, 0, 1, 0, 5, so this matrix is positive semi-definite, and if you take this matrix, plug it in here and expand this, then you'll get your polynomial back. And furthermore, this matrix is positive semi-definite because it's of a form L transpose L, where L is a matrix 1 of square root of 2, 2 minus 3, 1, 0, 1, 3. And I know kind of from here, we can explicitly write down that my polynomial is a sum of squares because it's going to be 2x squared plus 3y squared plus xy squared plus 1 half, I know, uh, y squared plus 3xy, if I did everything correctly. Minus, Minus here, yes, thank you. So algorithmically, what I need to compute is this matrix Q. So then it will be some boundary position at the end. Uh, so in here, what I'm, the only thing I'm claiming, and one can fill in all the details, is that what I'm doing is I'm saying that this question is exactly reducible to a semi-definite problem question. We, Michel, skip this too. Now, you know, if you really want to talk about the complexity aspects of like, you know, what exactly is complexity of semi-definite problem, then like, you know, kind of you're opening a little bit of a can, and it's not really a can of worms. I mean, you just have to take care of a whole bunch of uh, things. But mostly, like, you know, most of the time, we talk about the approximate question. Right? You talk approximate feasibility of a semi-definite problem. Like, you know, kind of, or that's the other thing. If you can guarantee that there's an interior point, then you're perfectly fine. Right. If you guarantee that you know, kind of there's an interior, that the, uh, your semi-definite problem actually has an interior solution, then you get full polynomial time solvability. Because you don't have in here this kind of uh, bad behavior that can happen in some other things. Good. Um, so let me also mention one thing. Most of the time, we never care about the Q sub i's. When you talk about the sum of score certificates, or when you never actually compute the Q sub i's in the sense that you know, kind of in here, these polynomials are not really the important thing. The important thing is this. 
is a positive semi-definite matrix that actually certifies that your polynomial is, uh, is a sum of squares. Because in particular, like, the factorization is far from being unique. Right, like, you know, there's many ways of factorizing a matrix, but like, you know, kind of this, uh, again, this is also non-unique. Essentially, for any point in here, you have a different sum of course representation. But the point is that uh, uh, somehow this, it's a lot easier to, uh, it's a lot more natural to prove properties about this object rather than the, the F subwise. In general, we don't care. Uh, sorry, the Q subwise. In general, we don't care about that. Good. Questions? Okay, let me mention two. A, well, the delay, so I wasn't sure when to throw this in, but there was a question that I missed oh. from the internet. Oh. <laughs> how, how do you write the AMGM inequality as a sum of squares? So essentially what you use, so by the way, Horwitz did this. Now you know, you know what you write is uh, x1 to the 2d plus x2d to the 2d minus 2d x1 x2d. This is actually a sum of squares. Some trivial, but you know, kind of, this is actually a sum of squares, and essentially from this you prove this. And know this, interesting point, why does it actually contradict what I was saying before you know, kind of in terms, because in here the inequality that you prove is actually the number of variables is equal to the degree. This actually makes a difference. You know, kind of, uh, yeah. Again, yeah. Uh, if you look at Bruce, Resnick's papers, I know he talks quite a bit about this. Because one can actually use this as a seeding, as a way of producing examples of polynomials which are not negative, but not so much. So, given that there are lots of solutions potentially in general, do you care for particular? It depends on, well, let's, let me give two answers to this. You know, one is there is, like in every semi definite program, there is a canonical answer. Like, you know, kind of that comes from if you want the maximum entropy solution or like, you know, kind of the one that maximizes the determinant of this. Uh, and one can write it and it has some nice properties. So for instance, in the univariate case, a property that this matrix will have is that the inverse is, is Hankel. Right? Like, you know, kind of when you look at this, but, like, you know, when you look at essentially the optimality conditions, the inverse is going to be Hankel and that's actually good for some other things and it's kind of nice in the interior of the set and whatever. For some other things, like, you know, sometimes, uh, we want to do something simpler, right? You want to say, okay, let me try to avoid solving a semi-definite program, and let me try to just write the matrix based only on the coefficients. Like, you know, there's different candidates in particular. There's a very nice natural candidate to just, that respects, if you want, the invariance of the problem. And like, you know, of course, then the issue is, how do you show that the positivity condition holds? And like, you know, that's a little bit what goes on in some of the uh, things I guess Ankur will talk about on Tuesday, some of these, when you look at the analysis of random problems, you don't want to actually solve a semi-definite problem. So essentially, you rely on some recipe. You know, kind of, and then the whole game is to prove that that recipe actually has the, the, the positivity conditions that you want. And if you kind of impose enough structural constraints on what you like that condition to be, then you know, there are some natural guesses. On and again, one can quantify this a little bit more. Pablo, there's another uh, question from the internet. So the question is, is there an easy way to know what is the best basis of polynomials from which to make the SDP for determining some of squares? Well, like everything best depends on you know, kind of what you want. Combinat so for combinatorial problems, monomials are fine. Yeah, sorry. So the question is, you know, kind of, uh, what is the best basis? I said in here, which is something that is true, that uh, in like everything that I said, of course. But uh, you know, kind of, <laughs> that in here, you can pick uh, any basis of the space of polynomials. Uh, but of course, they have different stability. Depending on what you want to do, I mean, some may be better or worse. From the numerical point of view, there's strong reasons why uh, if you have some understanding of your set, say you're doing things on the cube or the sphere, then you, know, you would like to pick in here a family of orthogonal polynomials. I mean, polynomials with some kind of orthogonality property underneath, they have good numerical properties. Some other cases, like in the combinatorial case, and I'll talk perhaps a little bit more about this, there's some nice, uh, there's some reasons for picking bases with some combinatorial interpretation. And you know, I'll give at least two examples of that later. Uh, so it really depends on whether you care about the numerics of it or you care about the analytic work. And you know, kind of doing things on paper. On paper, any basis will be fine. <coughs> Quite often, it's very nice and very simple to work with monomials or scale monomials or something like this. But uh, numerically, particularly if you're working in, in RN, uh, num 
monomials are a horrible basis, right? They're essentially, they're very nearly orthogonal. If you try, like, you know, there's essentially no difference numerically between x to the 100 and x to the 99, right? They're kind of the same thing numerically. So you really want to work with somehow orthogonal polynomials, so those are a lot better. So. OK, so in the five minutes I have left, let me at least mention um, And I'll continue, I guess, after the break. But how do we take this very simple uh, question about the fixed polynomial? Right. So far, the only thing that I've told you is I have a fixed polynomial. Can I decide, yes or no, whether this polynomial is a sum of squares? Or, you know, I solve the semi-definite problem. If it's feasible, great. If it's infeasible, no, it doesn't work. So what I want to try to understand is how this is really the piece, or the you know, kind of really the centerpiece of a much larger machinery that will allow us to understand not just what happens for a single polynomial, but really understand you know, kind of systems of polynomial equations in general. And let me for that, you know, kind of, again, I'll talk about the general version after the break. But let me talk about the very, very simple case first, which is what would, be the, what would happen if what I want to do is to minimize my polynomial p, or attempting to minimize some polynomial p. And I claim that minimizing p is really kind of the same thing of trying to understand if p is greater or equal than, for what values of gamma. So again, picture, this is my polynomial. OK, this is not quite the polynomial. Then, you know, kind of, there's some value gamma. And I want, if I want to find a minimum, then perhaps that's equivalent to finding the best lower bound that I can. Finding the best lower bound is, of course, finding the best gamma for which p of x is greater or equal than gamma for all x. This is difficult, essentially not negativity. But something that implies this is to find the largest gamma such that p of x minus gamma is a sum of squares. And I claim that all the machinery that I told you about, that somehow before was about deciding whether a single polynomial is sum of squares or not, somehow extend to this situation in particular, but also to more complicated situations where the coefficients of p depend affinely on some decision variables. So let me highlight what I mean. Let's imagine that this is actually the case that I want. That I want to try to understand what's the largest gamma for which p of x minus gamma is a sum of squares. The same thing, just because my polynomial in here is not homogeneous and I don't want to change it. Let me assume that what depends on gamma in here is not the constant term like in here. But let me imagine that my gamma appears in here. Right, so I have a polynomial whose coefficients depend linearly on some parameters. Perhaps a single parameter like in here, perhaps many. I don't care. And I claim that the addition of this parameter or this you know, many parameters doesn't change a picture at all. Why? Because what did I do? In here, I wrote some quadratic form in here or some matrix. And then I wrote linear equations that would say that the coefficients of this were going to be equal to the coefficients of this. So now, if I put linear dependence on some parameters in there, the only thing that changes is that before I was saying that this was equal to minus 1. And now I can just say that this is equal to minus gamma. So now what I'm going to have is linear equations between the entries of q and some decision variables that I added. But still, it's exactly the same picture. What are the constraints that I have? I have something that has to be possibly semi-definite. And I have some linear equations that need to be satisfied. And this is going to be crucial, because really the important thing about sum of squares is not that I can decide for a single polynomial whether it's a sum of squares or not, but it's really that if you have an affine subspace of polynomials, I have an affinely parametrized subfamily of polynomials. So in here, you know, I have a gamma. In here, I can write 2 plus beta. In here, I can write you know, kind of 2 plus 5. Gamma, whatever, uh, no, not gamma, right, delta. And I'm trying to find you know, values of these parameters in such a way that this polynomial is sum of squares. It's a nice semi-definite program underneath, in exactly the way that I described it before. And this is going to be very crucial for many things, but in particular for all this high hierarchy business. Right? And we'll see exactly how it happens. Uh, yeah, this is probably a good time to stop. Questions? Tweets?
bit Sorry? So what about the bit complexity? Uh, so I'm not saying anything at all about bit complexity again, because yeah. if you want to talk about, even for semi-definite programming, like, you know, kind of, uh, somehow you have to really look at the structure of polynomials, like, at the, the particular structure of the polynomials that you care about. So, for instance, like, you know, kind of, I mean, I guess we, we know this. There's, it's very simple to write, like, you know, kind of, every semi-definite problem is a sum of squares thing in disguise, right? So somehow, without answering the full question in the semi-definite problem in case for all polynomials, and like, you know, kind of, this is not. Uh, I mean, this is a more general case of that. For particular situations, when you restrict, for instance, like, you know, your polynomials to have a particular form or this or that, then like, you know, kind of, there are results of this type. Yeah. Maybe one more question before we take a break. All right, no worries. We're going to come back in half an hour. Right now we have a coffee break, and we'll have uh, more on some of the